One of the most miserable experiences in your software development career is going to be A, software development in general, and B, writing really slow software. Um, it's something that I have to do a lot. It's something that I don't have to do, but I do do a lot because I am not a good developer. Uh, but it's not something that you necessarily have to do. And people will argue over speed constantly. It's super annoying, especially Rust people. They seem to be like really honed in on this idea of speed, even though like they all write shitty software. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how to make Go specifically really fast um, through Go routines. Now, you probably clicked on this video because you want to watch malware development. We're going to get there. But first, first, we're going to understand Go routines, like in general, and then we're going to apply them to malware development. So I've got some AI-generated examples that I'm going to show on the screen here, and we're going to talk about them from the perspective of how we would hypothetically set them up for malware, but we're not going to have a lot of the like real complexity that you're probably wanting um, in a piece of Golang malware. Um, so let's jump into the code and we've got a very simple main function. We've got three different demo um, Go files um, and we're going to run them all you know, separately so that we can kind of break down how they work. Um, so the first one is demo one. Um, so let's jump over here. This is a very simple weight group worker setup. What a Go routine is, is a thread of execution. You can think about it that way. And you run that thread of execution asynchronously. What asynchronously means is that you run them at the same time as you're running a bunch of other stuff. So we're going to have like the main thread of execution and we're going to have, um, here we'll have five threads of you know separate execution. Each one of these is going to get its own ID and it is going to have its own weight group. Um, so what this weight group is, is it's just a group that you're waiting on. I know, that's annoying. It's a group of tasks or a group of threads of execution that you're waiting to eventually finish. Um, or I guess you don't technically have to wait for it to finish, um, but here we are in fact waiting for all of them to finish. Um, and what this right here is doing, defer in Golang means that once you exit this block of execution, or once you're about to, run this function right here. And what this function is doing is it is signaling to the wait group, hey, this thread of execution is done. So we're creating a wait group, we are adding workers to it, and we are creating those asynchronous threads of execution. Um, so that's really it. Essentially what we're doing here is we are adding a group of asynchronous threads of execution. So if we run this, we get all five of them starting and all five of them finishing. Um, now they didn't, as you can see, finish like at the same time or like in any specific order, um, I believe. Yeah, they didn't all finish at the same time or in, in, in any specific order, um, which kind of is a hint at least that they're running asynchron asynchronously. Um, we can make this a little bit more complicated, um, but we're going to save that for the next demos. Um, so let's pop over to main dot go and we are going to run demo two and again before anybody gets mad this one's actually pretty obvious that it is a um, ai generated uh, template but i do have some comments in here that i've created just to kind of guide how you can start to think about this from a malware developer's perspective um, this one right here is the consumer producer uh, kind of pattern um, so we create a channel. We'll talk about a channel in a second. We are going to create a producer that produces some data and a consumer that consumes some data. Now, before we jump in, let's think of the producer as a keylogger. What a keylogger can be thought of is a separate thread of execution from the main executable, um, or perhaps it's its own like dedicated executable. But normally it's spawned as its own thread um, or its own process and it is going to log your keystrokes and then it is going to somehow communicate those keystrokes in an asynchronous manner back to mothership back to the main thread of execution or back to another thread of execution what you don't want is your keylogger to be waiting on file io in order to continue so let's say you're logging 100 keystrokes and then you have to wait for all 100 of those keystrokes to be logged to a file and then you start logging keystrokes again well those couple of you know, milliseconds, maybe even a second that you had to wait in order to write things out to file, you may have missed a couple of keystrokes that may have been part of a password or something interesting that you wanted to get off of a 
victim system. You're not actually going to victimize anybody with this. You're testing it on your own systems, I'm sure. But that is basically the idea. You want to have your own thread of execution that does the keystroke pulling, and then you pass those keystrokes to a consumer right here. And let's say this is the logger. So this is the, let's call it a key sniffer. And that is the key logger. Now, how do we do this? Okay. We've created a channel here. This channel is a string channel. What that means is that it can take in strings and it can pass strings back and forth. So we pass this channel to both the producer and the consumer. This producer takes that channel in and it passes messages into that channel. This consumer waits for values within that channel and then it does something with them. That's it. Now, this could also pass values back to the channel. If you wanted a multi-directional channel, you can do that. Um, but for right now, we're just going to keep it very simple by having this consumer producer pattern um, where this producer is what is actually logging the key log or, or this producer is what is sniffing the key logs and this consumer is writing them out to files. So this, I, I guess this time.sleep right here, you can picture that as file IO. Whereas this right here is actually listening to the keystrokes via the Windows API or what have you. Um, and then we're waiting um, a certain period of time to kind of finish uh, the actual producer production and consumption. Um, but we could just as easily like wait for them all um, by adding a wait group. So let's actually do that. WG, let's do let, not let, um, WG, uh, sync dot wait group. Uh, let's see, like that, I think. And then WG dot add one. WG dot add one. We're going to pass the weight group. Let's do and WG. We're going to get some errors for a second and WG. If we go up here, we can look for a weight group. Weight group, and this is going to be a pointer to sync dot weight group. I uh, don't think we need this actually. And down here, same thing. WG sync dot weight group. And then all we're going to do here is defer WG dot done. And same here. Defer WG dot done. All right, so instead of this sleep, we're going to do a WG dot wait. All right, so this will work just as fine, I hope. I haven't actually tested this. Producing, yep, looks like that's working fine, and it's going to wait for all of them to be done, um, and we are good to go. So that is how you can kind of combine the weight group pattern with this consumer producer. Weight groups are super nifty. That's It's kind of something that you're going to want to at least familiarize yourself with. Um, you may not have to use them as much with malware development. We're just kind of going to play that by ear. Um, but yeah, that's that's how you can use weight groups within this consumer producer pattern. Um, as long as you are adding them here, the weight group knows for, like it knows how many weight signals to wait for essentially. You might be able to, I'm kind of playing around with this. Um, I'm not sure if you can just do this. Let's see if that works. Because we're only adding two, we shouldn't have to call it twice. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, cool, okay. Um, so let's run over to main, demo three run, and let's go to demo three. Demo three is a little bit more complicated, but not by that much. We are going to take those channels and we are going to ramp them up a little bit. We're going to create workers that are going to basically be pulling jobs off of a job queue. Um, so we are going to create three workers by default and 10 jobs by default. Now these jobs and results, um, those are just very, very simple structures. They're, they're just data structures. You don't have to worry about them. They're not a big deal. Don't, don't panic. You're going to be okay. Um, so we are creating a channel for the jobs. We are creating a channel for the results of those jobs. We are creating our handy dandy weight group here. And then we are going to add all of those, um, all of those jobs or add all of those workers, sorry, to a weight group. 
and we are going to create the workers themselves. Now, until these workers actually get a job, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to kind of sit there. So those workers are just going to kind of chill, but they are going to wait for a job. And each of these jobs is going to be passed to a worker and it's just going to be one job per one worker. You don't really have to worry about like creating queues or anything complex like that. You're workers are going to work off the job queue because that channel is only going to have one instance of one job each and every single time. Like you're not going to have to worry about like deduplicating them. It's a really nifty way of doing this. Um, so we're creating the jobs here um, and we are sending them to the jobs channel. Now, since these workers all have the same instance of the jobs channel singleton, they are all going to be pulling from the same list of jobs. Again, you don't have to do any du deduplication here. This is really, really nice if you've ever had to do any kind of like net code or anything like that. All of these workers are going to get the same exact channel with the same exact number of jobs. And when one worker pulls a job out of the channel, the other two workers won't mess with it. Like it's done. So this is a really, really good pattern to kind of get used to. Um, so this is basically creating a go function that's just going to wait for the results um, channel to close. Um, that's that's really all it's doing, um, so, which is basically just waiting for all of the workers to be done. And then you're going to collect the results. So let's run this and we'll see what it kind of looks for. Um, so as you can see, like they're not all finishing in the same synchronous manner. Um, that's to be expected. Um, and again, you know, this is a really, really great way to do anything like connect code related. So this is probably what we're going to be using for a lot of the C2 channel stuff. That's going to be pulling jobs off of a queue. Um, again, this is a really important pattern to kind of memorize. Now, again, I know there are some of you who might be angry that there's not any like malware development specific stuff here. We're going to get there, but trust me when I tell you, you really, really, really want to understand how go routines work before you start diving into like using them for malware development. Um, but we will get to that in the next video. Take it easy. Peace.